We're okay. live, Kelly. We're live. So we'll call the, the meeting to order. If I can everybody to, um, ask everybody to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. And turning to our meeting agenda, we have the approval of minutes for May 19th, 2021 and May 24th, 2021. Did we have any questions? It's or actually comments? May 26th. Oh, thank you. Okay, May 19th, 2021 and May 26th, 2021. Thank you, Julia. Um, did anybody have any comments or edits to those meeting minutes? Okay, not hearing any. Could I have a motion to approve the May 19th, 2021 meeting minutes, please? So moved. So moved. Second. Um, okay, so now we have to do roll call vote. Kelly? Aye. Julia, sorry, you should have gone first. Aye. Uh, Matt? Aye. And Kristen? Aye. And Shannon? Aye. And can I have a motion to approve the May 26, 2021 meeting minutes, please? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, Julia? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Matt? Aye. Kristen? Aye. And Shannon? Aye. Okay. Um, now we move into our, we have our first opportunity for comments from the public. Um, and I just wanna read our um, statement for that. Um, speakers may offer comments regarding school goals, policies, budgets, operations, programs as concern them, the performance of superintendents, any other matter within the school committee's scope of responsibility. But in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints regarding school personnel, students, or others which are outside the scope of the school committee's responsibility. Uh, improper conduct will not be allowed. Defamatory, improper, or abusive remarks are always out of order. If a speaker persists in improper conduct or defamatory, improper, or abusive remarks, the chair may terminate that individual's privilege of address. Um, defamatory remarks will mean remarks that have been adjudicated defamatory. Improper and or abusive remarks shall mean obscenities, vulgarities, threats, and fighting words or remarks likely to provoke a violent reaction. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna ask Dr. Antonucci to assist me with um, the logistics of public comment. And if uh, people in attendance wanna participate, they can just uh, raise their hand within Zoom. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay. All right, then I guess we will move on to reports for the school committee and the superintendent is up on deck first. Yeah, good evening. I, I just have one thing and it's, it's important. Um, on Monday evening, uh, I received um, the report on the investigation into the Duxbury High School football program. Um, I am currently working on a report uh, with a summary of findings. Uh, and my plan um, is to put that in memo form to the school committee, um, hopefully by tomorrow afternoon. Uh, and I just want you to be on the lookout, um, on the lookout for that. Um, so that, that, that's it. <laughs> Okay, John. And the 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 memo form that'll be sent to the school committee is is what is um, what can be kind of legally released to the school committee, right? Is how is that yeah. how, we're, how we're framing that. I just want to. Yeah, I I just want I just want to say I mean we're we're obviously working very closely with um, legal counsel um, to provide a summary that contains as much information as possible. Um, but that's legally permissible, right? Perfect. So that, that it's not a violation of uh, employer or student privacy laws. So yeah, I appreciate you asking that question. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. 
<laughs> yep, thank you. So then we have the assistant superintendent, Dr. Klingeman. Do you have anything to report to the committee? Thank you. Yes, I do have a couple of announcements this evening. Um, first of all, it came up during our listening session, which I think was two weeks ago at this point, that um, parents may be um, interested in some more detailed information about professional development days and what topics are being covered. Um, so I just wanted to say that's a really easy fix. We'd be happy to um, not only continue to report out at school committee meetings, but I can also publish a calendar on the district website, um, which I will, I will certainly update and bring to everyone's attention if I make any changes to it. But I will let um, you as a committee, as well as our families know where they might be able to find the topics being covered at our professional development for the 2021, excuse me, 21-22 school year. Um, I have an announcement about our new science curriculum supervisor. So we are pleased to announce that Karen Irvine will be our new science curriculum supervisor, replacing Kathy Harmon, who unfortunately is leaving us July 1st. So Mrs. Irvine has been a science teacher here at Duxbury High School since 2005 and has been instrumental in the development of the AP biology curriculum and many other science courses. Mrs. Irvine is a teacher leader and we feel that she will be a great addition to our administrative team and with supporting the science department in grades six to 12. And I should note that Mrs. Irvine will continue to be involved in the AP program moving forward. And so we wish Kathy Harmon all the best in the future. She's been a wonderful asset to our science department for the last six years. I also wanted to share that we have been able to add the position of coordinator of diversity, equity, and inclusion to our district um, to lead the work we have pri prioritized in this important area. So our new DEI coordinator will collaborate with a range of districts, district and community stakeholders to ensure that the Duxbury Public Schools will make significant progress on the critical system goals of ensuring that our schools are both welcoming and inclusive to all and reducing opportunity and outcome gaps based on race and other demographic subgroups. So this position will function like a curriculum supervisor position where the director will continue to teach but also serve an administrative capacity. And we, should, we were able to add this position due to the reorganization of the technology department um, and cost savings. And this position will be able to be added without adding an additional FTE. And so this fell within our budget that we had um, proposed and was approved. And finally, um, on Friday, I wanted to alert um, our families, anyone that's listening, that we'll be sending out an email um, from the curriculum office, my office, that contains links to summer enrichment and practice activities for all grade levels and content areas for the summer. We know that our families continue to prioritize and reinforce learning over the summer months. And on that same email, we have a survey seeking, inter, um, seeking input on um, parent interest about some no cost evening parent programs that the school district would like to sponsor next year. So um, I've spoken to some families about this and they've really enjoyed the programs we've put forward so far, but we would like input on topics that are um, of most interest to our families. And based on the feedback we receive, we'll start scheduling some um, parent events for the fall into the winter and spring. And that's all from me. Great. Um, the DEI coordinator is who is that reporting into? That will report to the assistant superintendent and will be part of okay. the district administrative team. Okay, great. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah, so um, Danielle, that DEI coordinator, that they're going to be a director level position with also teaching responsibilities. Is that what you said? Yes, that's correct. They'll be teaching and two courses. And so is that, uh, and maybe it's too early for you to know or share, but is that an internal person or are you opening that search up outside of the district? So it's an internal posting currently, and we do have some internal candidates. And so um, our thought is to see how we can do with um, promoting from within if there's, if there's candidates that are qualified for that and have the appropriate licensure and experience, but we can certainly post out if we, um, if we needed to. But right now it's an internal posting and we do have um, interest that's been shown. And do you have like a timeline for when you would expect to fill the position? Yes, we um, posted the position, I think two Fridays ago. So this coming Friday, the position will have been posted for two weeks. And um, at that point, we'd hope to be able to conduct some interviews next week to be able to have that position filled before um, we get too deep into June, but hopefully before July 1st. Okay, great, thanks. Um, the only thing I was going to say was I, the summer, the, um, 
programs that you're planning to add for for parents going forward and seek i love that you're seeking input from the community um and i know some of the programs you can't record them or keep them but some of them you've done that to the extent we can kind of make those available um, for people who can't make the actual times so i would just encourage the school to consider that um, okay so next on reports is uh director of business and finance Ms. blake Hi everyone. Um, so tonight I wanted to bring to your attention um, the invoice warrant that was processed since our last school committee meeting. Um, so we have one warrant um, that was approved and released and that was warrant number 48. Uh, that was processed on May 28th of 2021. And it was processed in the amount of $653,000 um, and I also just wanted to mention that we do have an invoice um, warrant that has a process date of June 11th. So that will process on Friday. Um, that's warrant number 50. And the total amount is $604,457.51. Um, I also just wanted to follow up on one of my updates that I provided in the May 19th school committee meeting. So um, I had mentioned that we were in the process of undergoing an audit on our student activity accounts. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that there is a, a draft copy of the audit report um, that I received from Powers and Sullivan in, in, regards, to, in regards to that audit. Um, the report has not yet been finalized, so it still has to undergo a second a secondary review um, at the audit firm. But once that's complete, I'll provide you with a summary of the corrective actions that we'll be taking um, as a school district in order to ensure full compliance with the auditor's recommendations. So I uh, just wanted to give you a, a quick update on that. Can I ask a, a non, um, a, a separate question about the budget? Um, would the school bus contract, and this, this is kind of a petty question, but I was in Hanover last week, say noontime, and a Duxbury bus passed me, and I thought to myself, why is there a Duxbury bus in Hanover during the school day? So um, do we, are we monitoring where the buses go, or um, do they have certain routes, or do we pay attention to the mileage, or I know some companies, you know, you're, you have to log in everything, so where are we at? Yeah. yeah, so that's actually a really good question. And um, I know in my home district, I, I, I've seen some some buses that say Duxbury Public Schools on the side. So it's all under, the fleet is all under the umbrella for student. Um, and sometimes they do. So as part of our contract with the first student, we do want to have our buses have the Duxbury Public School logo on the side. But sometimes um, with the bus fleet, because there's other districts in this area that also utilize for a student, they can reallocate the buses. And because we did have a reduction in our bus fleet for this year, so we reduced the number of routes because of hybrid, they've reallocated those buses to other districts. So we're certainly, we're definitely not paying for them. Um, and it's just, I think it's just a matter of, they didn't rebrand the name on the side. Um, but we can ask for any types of mileage reports, route reports. Um, we do receive some fuel reports too for the usage. So we do have um, visibility into that and to any other charges. Okay. Um, and John, I think, is working on it. But uh, John and Danielle, I guess some people are having a little bit of trouble accessing the the site. So I don't know if we were able, it looks like the number just jumped up. So hopefully those people were able to get in now. Yeah, I, I was trying to type a response. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, it's not the, the link is the same one we've always used. So I'm not sure what, what we can do. Um, right. Okay. Well, ho hopefully it's resolved because I, I did notice that the number went up by a few people. So, um, okay. Uh, the next report is our student representative, Jake. Um, just a few quick things. It's just like what the students have been doing for the past few weeks. So this past week was underclassmen SUMA awards, which was last night. And on Saturday there was graduation, 
which is very exciting. Um, I thought it was very cool to be in attendance with no COVID restrictions, which is very nice. Um, and then the week before there were senior awards and then it's pretty much just been winding down the school year with just a few catching everything up and just been a few busy um, past few weeks because it's the end of the school year. And um, that's all I have. Okay, great, thank you. And the last report, the chair's uh, report. Um, Jake, you beat me to it. I just wanted to congratulate all the 2021 um, graduates. And I think it was a great ceremony. Um, and it really was amazing to have everybody all outside together, no masks and stuff. It was a, a great experience. Um, I also wanted to follow up on the a listening forum and thank you everybody who participated. Um, I think there were about 36 or 37 um, comments. A majority of them were about the football investigation, which we now know we'll, we'll hear more about uh, tomorrow. So I think that that follow up will help. Um, the other um, several comments were about the ongoing um, litigation that we can't comment on at this time. And then um, Dr. Klingeman addressed the, uh, the question about professional development. Um, and then there were one or two other items that we're working through. So I just wanted to kind of give an update on that, that we're, that, um, we're trying to process all the comments and, and getting back to folks as we can. Um, and then um, wanted to kind of address the, the news that we've all heard that um, Dr. Antonucci is, um, um, is negotiating now with North Attleboro to be a new superintendent there. And um, I want to also congratulate him on the Massachusetts Association of Superintendents President's Award that he won a few weeks ago, and we haven't had a meeting. So congratulations, Dr. Antonucci, on that award. Um, with regards to the superintendent, um, I think as a committee, we need to, um, we don't have a meeting date for our next meeting. So, so we need to find a meeting um, probably in short order to discuss a process for um, superintendent search once we know that Dr. Super, the Dr. Antonucci is, you know, you know, signed <laughs> once it's really actually finalized. Um, and um, I, I wanted to kind of share some thoughts having gone through a superintendent search before, because we're going to need to really build out a timeline and agree some on some process. But um, it will need to schedule a meeting to really do that and have a public deliberation about it. But you know, the process that we followed in the past was to issue an RFP to, to find a, a search firm to help us with the search. And then um, let me just look to my notes, um, select that vendor, um, develop uh, qualifications and application pra uh, packet, like a salary limit, a profile, um, hold stakeholder focus groups to obtain information from the broader community on the profile, um, begin recruiting, uh, point a screening or um, selection committee, screening or selection committee, um, all types of meetings involved with that, pre screening, and then presenting qualified candidates. Um, and then three to four finalists are selected by that committee for school committee consideration. Um, and then there's a second round of interview, candidate visits, final interviews, et cetera. So that's just a very high level. And um, before our next meeting, when it's on the agenda, I can send out those notes. They're from the previous process. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to flag that for people, get people's minds going about it. And then um, I guess we can pick a date um, by email because we can do logistics by email. So, but just if folks can kind of look, I think, I think next week with the last week of school, I think it might be pretty tough to fit that in. Um, so it might, but so it might be the week of the 21st. So um, any comments or questions at a high level? I don't. Um, the only question I would have is the last time, do we have a sense of when you put the whole process together what the overall sort of general timeline was from beginning to end? Yeah, yeah, the, it was um, originally slated to go June to February, which is mm -hmm. kind of a very, that would be a, a good time timeframe. Um, 
in that particular case, it ended up being June through December. Um, and that was because <laughs> that was because the um, search firm, the gentleman who was assigned to assist us, uh, was going to Florida in as of like December 23rd. So everything had to be wrapped up before he went on his. Good for him. Did he have a good time? He did. Good. I think he did. Good. Um, so, so, <clears throat> and I will tell you, having gone through that, it was um, extremely intense. So wow. um, I think, you know, I think that through the February for a full search is probably, um, might be a better idea than. Well, I guess we know what questions to ask up front in the RFP. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I've sent, I've sent um, in full disclosure, I have the old RFP and I went ahead and proactively sent it to Katie and also Rainy Reed um, to see from kind of a, um, what is it called? Um, like a regulatory statute perspective, are there any things that we need to update? And then I was gonna, once we have a date um, that would be included in the media, media materials so that everybody could give um, feedback on the parameters of the RFP, but the RFP is very much just like what firm, you know, what search firm is going to help us. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. So, great. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to highlight, everybody, unless something gets pushed through the um, Beacon Hill this week, the the state of emergency is um, mm -hmm. terminating. So as of June fifteenth, any meetings we have will need to be lot uh, in person meetings. Um, I know the um, select board is working with Rainy Reed right now to figure out what that's going to look like. And I think um, I'm going to reach out to them, um, you know, before the weekend and figure out, you know, how we can kind of parallel our process to make sure that we're, we're managing it appropriately with open meeting law and the change. So um, stay tuned for more information on that. And um... Shannon, I don't know if it's going to be part of the discussion. It probably will be just from what I've read in the paper, but um, it would be good to just, you know, make sure that there's some discussion around um, seeing if it if we can continue virtual, which so I know I know that's on the table. I just want to make sure that it stays there when you guys have that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. What and I what I what I think the select board might be trying to do because it gets a little tricky when you go all in person is I think they might have the meeting folks, the, the committee in person, but they might have all participation remote. I think that's what they're trying to navigate because oh, right. the problem is when you open the doors, right? Then you can't, um, I, mean, I guess there's no social distancing anymore, but I think there's still kind of an awareness about, you know, are you gonna go right from zero to 60? Yeah. Immediately, or are we gonna kind of stepwise this? So, but that is being handled by the, town attorney and I want to kind of follow their lead on that. Cool. Okay. Okay. So that, those are the things that I hope I didn't miss anything. Um, and I usually say if anybody else has um, something that they want to share, I'm happy to open it. Kristen. Yeah. I just wanted to um, congratulate the class of 2021. I was really excited to be a part for to go to graduation, um, I found the speeches to be sp so inspiring from the students that gave speeches. And I don't know if it's online, but I really encourage the parents um, of all our students to go listen to them because it really kind of gave me a lot of hope. And um, some of the themes of the speeches were rethinking success, wishing time away, your moment to stop and observe, wonder wheel of life, the tide will turn and embrace your blunders. And I just wanna say great job to all the students, teachers, staff, and administration. I wanna thank Danielle, Dr. Klingeman, and the reading curriculum coordinators for meeting with me last week regarding my questions surrounding the reading curriculum. And it was a very productive conversation and I look forward to more and potential follow-up presentations sometime in the fall. I wanna say congratulations to all the teachers and staff who are retiring, especially my daughter's uh, teacher. Best of luck to all of you in your retirement. And I also just want to thank everyone for getting through a very challenging year, um, teachers, administrators, staff, parents, for helping make it a very successful year for the students. Um, so that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Okay. 
Shannon, can I add just to Ms. O'Connell's comment, the commencement is available online, the entire, uh, the entire ceremony. And uh, if you search the DTV Vimeo page um, in any search engine, you'll find the entire uh, ceremony. Thanks, Mr. Dunn. Thank you. Thanks for being there. It was great. It looks like um, we're moving on to discussion items in the agenda and we have a portrait of a graduate update with Jen Cotton Herman. Hi. Hi, yes, thank you for having me. Um, Jim, I think you're gonna start us off. Would you like me to share that presentation as you begin? I think Dr. Klingman was going to. Or so, that, perfect. <laughs> so I just wanted to, um, uh, to, uh, to do two things here. First is to uh, thank, um, uh, all the members who have served on our portrait of a graduate committee this year uh, from across the district. And there have been a lot of uh, teachers uh, and, and here are some of our teachers and administrators who have been a part of it. Ms. Bollinger, Mrs. Donovan, Ms. Drain from DMS, Mr. Lesniak, Ms. Nichols, Mr. Palmer, uh, Mr. Alberti, Ms. Cotton Herman, Ms. Coyne, uh, Ms. Harmon, Dr. Klingeman, Ms. McGuire, and uh, Mr. Warmington for their, for their work. This has been a, a year long project that started with uh, uh, focus groups in the fall. Uh, but it has really been uh, spearheaded um, by Ms. Cotton Herman, who is uh, a, a, an assistant principal of the high school. She's new to the district this year, uh, and she's just been an incredible asset uh, in so many ways. And, um, and so tonight is the first uh, time she's been at school committee. And so I wanted to introduce her to you. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to turn uh, the rest of this presentation over to her. Thanks, Jim. Um, yes, and thank you um, for having me tonight. I'm really excited to be here. And um, for those of you I haven't gotten to meet in person um, or even virtually, I'm, I'm Jen and I am um, an assistant principal at the high school this year. So um, I really wanted to really paint a picture of the work we've done this year on the portrait of a graduate. Um, we started this work, you know, we started talking about it um, way back in the fall when, when I arrived here at Duxbury High School, um, but we really started the project in earnest this past January. Um, and the purpose of this document is really to, as it says here, to identify the skills and attributes um, that we wanted our Duxbury students to have as they graduated from our schools. But I think specifically, we weren't necessarily looking um, at specific skills in content areas or skills that would only be useful to students as as students, um, but really we wanted this to be a visionary doc, you know, visionary document um, that would be you know, something that everyone in the community could look to um, as a shared idea of what we believed would be important for students um, to have as they graduate, um, not just to be um, successful as a high school student, but successful, you know, in future uh, higher education, um, in their careers, wherever that might take them. And, and as, you know, members of their communities, as family members, as friends, as people in relationship, as citizens. Um, and so it, it kind of was a, a big undertaking and, and um, excited to tell you a little bit more about it. So the next slide, great. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give you an idea. I've told you what the purpose of it was, but um, you know, we're not the first district to undertake this process. Um, so this is an example of one of the attributes that um, the, Sh the Shrewsbury Public Schools um, came up with for their portrait of a graduate. One of the attributes they identified um, was wanting their students to be um, versed in how to be global citizens and how to be engaged. Um, and then they defined what that looked like. Um, I have another example from the other side of the country from the Evergreen School District in San Jose, California. And this is one where you can see um, that leaf on the side, they had six attributes. They had learner, critical thinker, communicator, collaborator, advocate, innovator. And then for each of those attributes, they identified um, really learning outcomes and learning targets for their students. Um, and then I had one other um, uh, example from the Coshocton City Schools in Ohio, um, they also identified critical thinker as just one of the cogs in their wheel. So everyone kind of has come up with their own way to, I think, visualize their portrait once they come up with it. I think Coshocton had four or five attributes, um, and then they kind of identified what each one would be um, in a paragraph or two. So 
this um, was kind of something that we looked at. Okay, there's many examples of this out there. Um, and so then we kind of kicked it off in January to see what it would turn out like for us here in Duxbury. Um, so the process beginning in January, um, we actually worked with an external consultant, Tony Bent, um, who, you know, here in Massachusetts was a teacher before he was a department head, um, before he was a district coordinator and then a superintendent um, and a school committee member. And now he chairs um, the Global Studies and 21st Century Skills Committee for the Massachusetts Associate, um, Association of School Superintendents. So he really helped frame this project for us. He had worked with other districts on it in the past um, and gave us, um, you know, as people who, everyone who um, attended some of these focus groups that I'll um, speak to in a second, he really tried to frame the project again in thinking forward um, to the rest of the 21st century and the world that our students, um, you know, will be graduating into and wanting to think about, you know, what are um, people in different industries saying they're looking from uh, for in candidates um, in recent college graduates and things like that. Um, what, what do people think um, are going to be the essential skills um, as we move forward um, into the future. And so he framed it that for us in these first two community focus groups. Um, and we wanted again, this to be a community effort. Um, and so we had two community focus groups, one in January and one in February. And at each of those, there were about 30 participants. Um, we had teachers from all four of our schools. Um, we had administrators from all the schools. We had parents from all the schools. Um, we also had middle and high school students there um, to provide the student perspective. We had uh, school commit committee members and also, um, you know, different community partners um, from across Duxbury. So we gathered um, feedback there um, in the form of, you know, really first discussing these articles that we had all read, um, but then also just brainstorming together, you know, having read these articles and listened a little bit to Tony's framing, um, you know, what did we all think? Um, you know, our students could really need um, as they graduate and move on. Um, and at the end of that focus group, it culminated with small groups um, of about five or six people coming up with, you know, what would they put forward as the six essential skills or attributes? So we, we you know, I think at each of those nights, we probably had about five groups um, and each of those groups came up with, you know, their own lists. And then we did the same type of activity with our administrative council, um, with the faculty at the high school, um, and with school councils at many of our schools. And so we really generated a lot of data. Um, the next slide, I think, is a word cloud, um, and it shows you a lot of that data. So we actually um, across all of those different discussions and focus groups, um, collected about 50 different skills and attributes, um, unique skills and attributes that people recommended um, be included. Um, so you can see that those that are the biggest here um, were ones that came up time and time again. I think we saw empathy really across the board um, in probably you know, 10 of those different groups. Um, but we also saw curio curiosity as being very important. Many groups mentioned um, self-awareness, cognitive flexibility, um, the importance of global citizenship and awareness. Um, and then, you know, those smaller ones across, you know, the sides, many of those were also mentioned two, three, or four times. Um, so moving forward after doing this more, you know, district wide um, and community wide data collecting, um, we came to that advisory panel, which were the people um, that Mr. Donovan um, thanked at the beginning. Um, we came back to that group with all of this data and really asked them to review it, to discuss it, um, and to try to start synthesizing it. Um, and the way we went about that was trying to, after discussing really, you know, what all of these, this data meant, um, try to group it into some overarching themes. Um, and so once we did that, we really saw for almost everything that was on that word cloud, almost all of those 50 terms fit into one of these um, four 
categories that we identified. And some of those terms fit into more than one, right? Um, you could see empathy maybe fitting into more than one of these, but, but those um, different categories were self-knowledge. So this included things like self-awareness, self-care, um, self-management and, you know, executive functioning. Um, collaboration and communication came up a lot and obviously included those attributes, but also things like, you know, those interpersonal skills, relationship skills. Um, it included teamwork and leadership. Um, learning agility and cognitive flexibility was really that cognitive category, um, you know, how students um, might persevere, um, how they might have the stamina to keep going on a difficult task, um, how they might analyze information or assess information and respond to it. Um, and then we also saw citizenship as being very important um, to, to many of the groups we spoke to, um, both on a global scale as well as on a local scale. Um, so we then, <laughs> I think the next slide, if you would, Danielle, um, Oh, or was there a slide before this? Oh yes, okay, sorry about that. Um, so what we did then was, these were kind of our four working titles. Um, we certainly weren't married to them. We knew that many of them were very wordy and long, um, but we tried to define each of these different categories. And then we went to collect more, more data and more feedback. So we asked um, the high school faculty for help with this, both in an open forum and, a, and in a faculty meeting where everyone was able to provide feedback. Um, we also talked to the high school's building-wide council, which again um, included both teachers and the student perspective, which was very helpful. Um, and our secondary leadership team, we put all of that feedback again together and went back to that advisory panel um, to come up with where we are today. Um, so on that next slide that I skipped to too soon, um, all of that feedback was aggregated and the advisory panel again really tried worked very hard to incorporate, um, I think most of it. Um, and we came up with two different um, versions of the portrait. I mean, they are, they each have the same four attributes, um, but one of the versions was really simplified, um, was something that we wanted to be able to fit onto one page with kind of a brief, as brief as we could make it, definition of each of those. Um, but we also have, um, a little bit more of an expanded version, you know, for somebody who wanted to dig into it a little bit further. Um, and that again has the definitions, but also really um, has bullet points to explain not just, you know, what each attribute is, but how graduates um, can demonstrate um, that they, you know, are living into that attribute. So what it looks like now in the simplified version, because that's the one I can fit onto one slide, um, is this. Duxbury Public School graduates are prepared for the rigors of post-secondary education, the, work for, the workforce, and service at local, national, and global levels. As our students mature through the Duxbury Public Schools, they will develop empathy and respect for themselves, others, and the world around them as empowered and healthy individuals, resilient and flexible learners, communicators and collaborators, and engaged citizens. So that self-knowledge became empowered and healthy individuals. Um, that cognitive flexibility and learning agility, which was so wordy, became resilient and flexible learners. Um, communicators and collaborators, that was a little bit of an easier title. And then finally, um, the citizenship became engaged citizens. Um, you know, some of the feedback that we got and, and that we totally agree with is that we really wanted these um, four attributes to describe the graduates themselves and not just um, an abstract noun or skill. Um, you know, we wanted it to be a little bit more action oriented and to do the same um, in the definitions themselves. Um, and so, so that has, is where, you know, we have landed today. Um, and, you know, we're excited to kind of continue this project. Um, certainly, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about each of the four of these, um, you can read that, that expanded um, version that there's a link in the, the slide deck um, to a document that has that. Um, and then I think, yeah, next steps, I was going to ask Danielle to talk a little bit about that. So Jen, if they click the link, the two versions of the final portrait, is this a link right here? Yes, it should be a Google Doc um, that 
that is open, that is viewable by anyone. And it has first that same one that was on the slide. And then the second page um, is that, I actually still fit it on one page, but I had to make the font pretty small. <laughs> Great. Okay. And then I think, oops, that I get to talk about the next steps for the portrait. Thank you, Jen. You did a wonderful job leading this process and just explaining everything, all the iterations that the um, portrait went through over the past year. Um, so our next steps with this, what do we do with it now that we have a final portrait? Um, we're going to continue over the summer to finalize the portrait so that it's in the best shape it can be. We are going to decide upon a visual representation of a portrait. And as Jen showed you in some of the slides, we might have a visual as well as some um, text. We might make it into a brochure. We're just gonna, we're gonna talk about what, the, what makes the most sense for us to be able to have this be like our strategic plan and that we did all that work to create and develop a strategic plan with stakeholder input. And then how do we make these a living document much like, like our strategic plan? So we'll, um, we'll continue to work on that um, process. The um, select board was also generous enough to be part. Um, Ted Flynn from the select board participated in one of our community focus groups, and he invited us to be able to present our final product, even if it was just in the draft that it's in right now at a select board meeting this summer. And um, he didn't forget at town meeting, he came up to me and asked if we had continued our work on this. And I was pleased to tell him that, yes, we've been working really hard on this all year with our team. So I think that invitation still stands. Um, and Tony Bent, who was our consultant that we worked with, was just blown away at the collaboration in our town and that we would get invited to a select board meeting to present this work. And he thought that was just amazing testament to the way the Duxbury community functions. Um, as we move into the planning for the 2021-2022 school year, we are going to, um, at our administrative retreat, we tech, usually we'll take a look at the year of the strategic plan that we're on. Um, we'll look at what we accomplished um, over the year. We already did our school improvement plan presentations with the principals, but we generally take a look at what we have left on our plan. And this is year three of our strategic plan. So we'll also, as part of our planning for next year, need to start thinking about a process for developing a new three-year plan. But we'll also look at ways that we can incorporate this portrait and those attributes across grade levels, because I think this is really important work that this isn't viewed as, okay, Duxbury High School, how are you going to get your graduates in four years to be able to exemplify all of those important attributes? It's really going to be the efforts of our pre-K through 12 teams to be able to say, what can we own um, in kindergarten? And I think that the one that jumped out the most at us was empathy. And so when we look at what does empathy look like in kindergarten all the way up to grade 12, I think what we're going to be working on is um, vertical alignment of what can we own grade to grade and what's developmentally, developmentally appropriate for students to be able to work on through the years so that when they get to Duxbury, they, this isn't the first time they've heard these words or had experiences that have led them to be able to have these attributes. And um, I, think, I think a lot of these attributes really lend themselves to project-based learning experiences, community service opportunities, being able to, um, just for one example, we have Duxbury Beach Preservation and we, we want our students to really know their local area, the history of it, what, what's special about the, um, just the ecology of the area. And so I think if we look at project-based learning through the years, through this lens of the Duxbury portrait of a graduate, I think we can come up with some really great project-based learning ideas that will um, be owned by grade levels or content areas or through projects. And I think that um, that's gonna be some really exciting work that hopefully you'll see reflected when the new school improvement plans are presented to you in um, the fall. And so we're looking forward to that. And um, just wanted to again, thank Jen and the high school team for their work on this this year. It was, it was a really fun project to work on. And thank you to our school committee members who attended that initial focus group. So you were aware of um, the start of this. And I hope that you like where it ended up, kind of seeing it from the very, very beginning first night focus groups to now. I'll stop sharing my screen. And I think Jen or any of us are available to answer any questions that you might have about this or any ideas that you um, that might have come to mind during the presentation. Thank you both. I, the thing that jumped out to me immediately was so many of the ideas and themes and thoughts were ones that I recognized from the, the strategic planning process several years ago, right? It's a lot of the same concepts. So it's, I think it'll be really nice to see how it all like intertwines and supports each other. 
Um, you know, sometimes when you hear about, you know, a project like this, it's, oh, you know, I worry that it's another big lift for folks, but it seems like it's really just another way of um, getting at much of the same things and just another uh, viewpoint on it, which I think is, is really nice. It pulls it all together. Uh, but I open it up for, for other questions and comments, of course. Well, I was going to say, I like the notion that you're going to be looking at a, a K through 12 kind of um, curriculum progression. Uh, it seems to me that a, quite a lot of that work is already going on through the SEL related um, projects and initiatives that are already in place. So I kind of think that, um, like Shannon says, it's unlikely to be a whole new kind of horizon for you all. But I do hope you'll come back and report to us when you have done that work, because it will be, um, you know, this is wonderful. And I think uh, it will be great to see how you develop the kind of the process across all, all the grades. So thank you very much. Anybody else? Good? All right, that's great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Jim and Jen, great job. I'm gonna put you off uh, off the panel, okay? I'm sure you don't- All know. right. <laughs> great job. Thank you all very Thank much. You. Take care. The um, next discussion item is the policy subcommittee update. Okay. Um, let me unmute myself kind of permanently so I have both hands. Um, so we met on the 24th of May, which is why I corrected you when we came to the minutes of previous meetings, because I knew I was worried that uh, there would be confusion um, with, uh, with our meeting. Um, but we discussed, um, as, as I included in the folder for preparation for this meeting, we discussed um, policies uh, BEDH, which is public comment at school committee meetings, um, and then a guideline document to sit alongside that, which is BEDH-E. Uh, and then we discussed BDE, which is a subcommittee's policy, which we didn't have as a district. So we are uh, proposing adding that. Um, and then a guidelines document that goes alongside that, which is BDE-E. Um, and so uh, um, those are the policies that the subcommittee has been talking about. There was also, I also uploaded to the folder some um, wording that we discussed that um, we're proposing placing on the school committee website so that um, members of the public will know, will have the access to public comments um, guidelines, you know, in an in easy, easily accessible uh, place. So, Anyway, um, and in, in uh, you'll see for, for BEDH, policy BEDH, um, and um, BEDH-E, what I did was uh, uh, we kind of started with the MASC model policy, and then I've showed, I've attempted to show where we modified it, either using a strike through uh, format for the, the items we wanted to um, erase and underlined format for the text that we wanted to add. So, um, and the, the website post document is, is all new. So, um, so there are no kind of markings on that because it's, um, kind of original to, it's original to Matt actually, <laughs> most of it. Um, and uh, so um, anyway, um, do you wanna uh, open the discussion to, for BEDH and BEDHE? Are there any comments or questions or additions, deletions? 
So you answered one of my primary questions was what was the process of drafting it so that you started with MISC and then made edits. And then the other piece, um, I think everybody's probably noticed, I've been reading additional language before the public comment. Right. And uh, um, I think, and I think this is true for all of our policies when we make these updates and make changes, especially if we're not just going with the standard MASC. I, I think our kind of final step in the process needs to, we need to run this by um, probably external counsel, um, specific, especially this one, because there was a case um, in recent years that impacts um, these comments. And that's where I was pulling the additional language that I've been reading in the meetings the last few times is right. it's called from that case law. So I just, um, that would be my, I didn't, I didn't go ahead and make those changes or edits because I kind of wanted to see what they thought of this version and, and let them make the changes that they think are necessary to it. Okay. Um, so thank you. Yeah. yeah, I think if my memory serves me right, we discussed at our, our subcommittee meeting that maybe the process is at, uh, when we get to the first first reading um, and we'll have, um, there'll be a period of opportunity for public comment, you know, either in this meeting or over the next 10 days or so. Um, and then any changes that are proposed, we'll try and incorporate them into the, this first draft. And then I think, ideally, we try and have the, the, our legal counsel look at the draft before it comes before the committee for a second reading, so that when we come around to approving it at the second reading, we know that it's, it's met with the judgment of legal counsel. If, does that make sense as a process? That makes sense to me. Okay, so I think that's the aim here. Um, and depending on what the timing is of our next meeting, and we may or may not have a, a, a second um, reading, you know, if, if there hasn't been enough time, if we're gonna have a, a, another school committee meeting in a fairly short order, there may not be kind of enough opportunity for public comments right. to be returned and then, and then uh, incorporated and checked by the legal counsel. So, you know, at some point, we'll bring it back for a second reading. But now the opportunity now is to really um, read through and, and offer feedback. And dig into it. For both yeah. of those. Yeah. Um, and then, so that's BEDH. Uh, and and um, then BDE is, uh, is a document. Um, Oh, I know. I had, oh, I had. Sorry. I did have one specific question. The okay. the, the public comment and the fifteen minutes guideline. Um, I think that comes from the MASC version. Um, I don't. I don't think we've ever. I, I know this. The chair has discretion to waive that time limit, but I don't think we've ever followed that. So I guess one of my questions for people to think about, and we can talk about it when it comes back through, is do we want to include that in there or not as a committee? Um, you know, because otherwise it's kind of like it's a standing waiver because we never, we never wash the clock on that, I don't think. So just a thought. Yeah, I think um, the, that's, that's right. Um, one thing to think about is if you don't set a, so if there's a topic that emerges that, you know, we have say 50 people, all who wanna talk about it. Yeah. Do we do that during a regular school committee meeting or do we acknowledge that actually that's such a, a topic that maybe we need to have a listening session just for that. Right. Um, uh, because, you know, school committee meetings where we're engaging our professional staff and everybody else, if we don't kind of, set some benchmark or some aim, yeah. you know, we end up potentially with a four, no way to kind of limit a four hour meeting or something like that. So that's, an, yeah, that's I mean, I something think to consider. I, I mean, there's a reason it's in there, right? But I just wanted to kind of try and flush it out a little bit. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, I think Julia, if it's a special topic, then you know, the chair should have a right to sort of limit if people are commenting on the same thing. Exactly. That I would hate for us to limit the public in a general meeting just 
you know, in the sake of time, because it's the only time they can talk to us if they don't want to call us, I guess. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So I don't want to do away with the discretion of the chair to waive the limit. Um, but I don't want to do away with the right of the chair to impose some limit of some kind. Um, just because could get um, could get difficult. Uh, as for BDE, which is subcommittees of the school committee, um, the wording is pretty much in line with MASC, as you'll notice. Um, but the guidelines document um, we devised uh, during our subcommittee meeting. So you'll notice it's all underlined because it's all new. Um, uh, and so there are kind of general duties of the subcommittee and then specific duties for the policy subcommittee. So we'd really appreciate your feedback on that as well. Um, and that, that I think is everything from me. We do have another policy um, that Dr. Klingeman, I think, wanted to uh, propose that we have a first reading. Uh, the policy subcommittee hasn't reviewed this, but this pol the policy changes come from the, is it the IT advisory committee or the? Yeah, so this yeah. came, the additional policy came from the digital literacy committee. Right. Um, and I believe Kelly and Matt are both on that committee. And so they were I'm present. Sorry. We had a meeting a few weeks ago where some recommendations were made for updates. And um, that's why we had requested if you wanted to add this to the list that you're um, considering tonight. Um, that was it was ready to be considered for um right. yeah and and matt and i didn't see any reason why we needed to delay bringing it to to you so. can i ask a technical question and probably as chair i should know the answer but um <laughs> when we say first reading do we have to read it out loud or is the fact that it's in the file and we've all read it sufficient do we know I, don't know. I think it's okay not to read it out loud, but I honestly, okay. it's been the way I've always done it, but I, we can certainly check on that. But. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure, because I, I don't know why all of a sudden I was like, first reading, is that only to read it out loud? <laughs> it seems kind of, I mean, a lot of, some of these policies are very long, so it seems a little bit silly, but I just thought I would ask. <laughs> we've never, we've never, read we've never done that, that, right? We haven't. No. Okay. All right. We just acknowledge it, talk about it. And that's the first. Okay. And also, do there, remember, these are available digitally too, which is right. the, the concept of first reading probably was from, you know, decades past when right. the, only mo the only time you actually Got read it. it was at a meeting, right? That's a meeting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so just okay. a quick question about the empowered digital use policy changes. Are they motivated by just um, changes in uh, or experiences that you're having within the school or kind of good practice or Mrs. Lewis, maybe. Julia, um, our DPS empowered digital user policy was approved by school committee in 2016. Right. Since then, we've brought in a lot more technology, a much larger infrastructure. Um, and also the, the ways that the, and it, focuses on a lot on clearly stating the illegal activities. Right. Um, and it's become much easier over the years for people sometimes as young as our students to be able to have access to some of these illegal activities. So we needed to take that sec section and make it clearer and understandable and add some of the newer ways that hackers are coming in that are very accessible to some of our students. Understood, great, thank yeah. you for that. You're welcome. Shannon, I was just wondering, do we, when we have a policy that we want review, do we send that to Julia and that beforehand and then it goes on the agenda? I recognized that I was on mute before I tried to say something. Well, uh, I think that's so, a first. <laughs> Go ahead, Julia. Yes, you probably, I was going to say, Julia, so, Matt, you can, so you can probably answer I, what you can Matt, come didn't, up with. I think we talked about this at our subcommittee meeting that we, we actually needed to ask 
all of you um, what the process, what you wanted the process to be um, for submitting requests for policy review. Do they, should they come first to the entire committee and ask whether there's a kind of, um, a, you know, with an explanation as to why a policy review is necessary, that there's a, a credible kind of rationale, or should it, they just, whatever request comes gets put into a queue. Um, and then, you know, who, who can request? I think generally our policies say pretty, pretty much um, any member of the school community can propose a policy review or um, request an agenda item um, come before a school committee, but I think we probably just wanna clarify how, how we'd like to do it going forward. I, I would, I mean, the ultimate decision rests with the full school committee. So I'd kind of like to see things go through the full school committee. So we're all okay. aware of what's on your plate. Sure. Um, if that makes sense. I mean, I don't want it to be a holdup in any way, but, and, and, you know, that can, it can be, yeah. So I, right. that would be my preference. I, I mean, I welcome other people's opinions, obviously. So, so, so maybe that's a, an item that goes into, you know, with the chair comments and then any other members comments at that kind of at the front of the meeting that there's, um, that, that the chairman mentions what policies have been requested for review, and then we kind of make a quick decision on whether they get handed to the subcommittee or not. Yeah. And, Does that make and sense? also email them to Shannon. Shannon will put them on the agenda and we'll agree yes or no. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think it's great. Okay. So um, at the moment, we've um, had a request from the Wellness Advisory Council to look at policies ADF, um, which is the Wellness Policy on Physical Activity and Nutrition, and CEA, which is the School Wellness Advisory Council policy. And then um, Shannon had suggested that we have a look at JEB, which is the Kindergarten Eligibility um, Policy. So can I can I make a couple of suggestions with that? So, um, yeah, so I think that uh, first of all, I'll, let me just share a screen because I, I figured it would be helpful to just take a sort of a bird's eye view on the policies that I could see that are under consideration. I didn't get uh, Danielle's uh, email until after I put this together. So the wellness stuff isn't on there. But um, can you see a spreadsheet? Are you guys reading a spreadsheet right now? Okay, so yeah. I would recommend that we sort of look at this almost like a product roadmap. So, you know, if you're developing like a technology product, you have to sort of wrestle with priorities and you have to wrestle with bandwidth and you have to wrestle with time and resources. So, you know, we, we just went through BEDH and BDE and the companion ones to them. And, and it's, a pro it's a process, even if it sounds simple, it's a process and we're going to put in you know, a legal set of eyes to take a look out of it and then go through a second reading. So I would recommend that we figure out how to make public the sort of the list of things in our, let's call it a pipeline. Like, so what are the policies that are on the roadmap that we're considering? And then allocate time in each school committee meeting to just do a sort of a gut check and say, okay, what's in our pipeline? What are we working on right now? Do we need to reprioritize other things that have come in on the pipeline? So a good example is we've gotten some great emails, I think, from a parent who would like us to reconsider the, uh, the entrance age, that JEB policy. Now, to me, that might be, I'm no expert, but that one might be time sensitive if we wanted to consider it because decisions might have to be made, you know, before the next school year. So that's kind of what I would do. I would just sort of take a running look at the policies in the pipeline so that we can continue to reprioritize as needed because my spider sense is tingling. I don't think we can work on like more than two at a time. You know what I mean? And then depending on some of these policies, they might require more input and collaboration and stuff. And those might take longer. But I, unless we have that sort of bird's eye view, I think it's going to be hard to reprioritize and figure out what we can handle. Great. So perhaps you could upload this um, 
could we delegate you to do take care of this excel spreadsheet and no, maybe up, you, you up, can do that no i'm just kidding <laughs> yes that's fine <laughs> upload <laughs> upload it and maintain it to a, a either the policy subcommittee google drive um and i can give sure. access to yeah, everybody yeah and so that good. you know we can if somebody if a constituent calls and says you know are you looking at xyz policy then we can just look on this spreadsheet and say yeah yeah it's on the list or no it's not on the list yeah i think that's that would be a good idea and then the only other thing i wanted to add um julia to your comments about the um the policies on public comment and the website is and, and i'm just i've got it up on screen right now i just think because this relates to policy drafts and stuff yeah i would recommend that we just add policies that are under consideration to the public facing website yeah so that and then invite community members to uh you know email us or use some other mechanism in the website to make mm -hmm. a case for a policy and a reason why they would like to see a policy and then that should again flow into that pipeline document Right. And to the earlier point, you know, we should have a chance to collaborate on it in a school committee meeting before we just green light it, regardless of how many community members like think it's important. Right. Just um, while we're all here and looking at this your voice document, can you scroll down, Matt, or scroll up rather, so we see the the text for the website for general public comments where it says your voice. Mm -hmm. um, public comment. I wanted to propose that we might add the words comments, concerns, and compliments, because I think that um, it might convey to people that actually we're prepared to hear um, a range of things, not just um, uh, uh, nothing has to rise to a kind of high level before we would be happy to hear it in public comment. So if even if somebody just wants to say I had a really nice experience with X, you know, that's that's useful to us. Or I'm concerned about something that might happen in the future. So I don't know. I uh, that was my one feedback on that. So I think it makes sense. Sure. Great. Okay. That's all for me. Okay. So should we should we, I guess the list isn't updated, but should, should we have that conversation of prioritizing what's on there now? Or do we want to do that at the next meeting since you guys need, since we're kind of working through the two that are pending right now? I'm okay with doing it now. I don't know, Julia, what you think or anyone else on the committee? That's fine. I, I mean, I think we do need to put ADF, the wellness policies on there. Um, and Oop, Dr. Klingerman, how how quickly do we need we need to help you finalize those or update those? Um, John, I don't think, I, I don't think that um, there is any rush on those. None of them okay. are time sensitive. So if they were to be um, adjusted Matt. next school, Matt, you're still sharing your screen. Yeah, I know. I'm. I thought we wanted to take a look at the list again. Yeah, yeah but we're showing it's your the list. wrong screen. Wrong screen. Oh, what am I sharing? Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Let me just. Uh... Hopefully it wasn't anything to do with my other job. Okay, there we go. Is that good? Yeah, that's yeah, good. That's good. Far out. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. So can you highlight the ones that are pending? For, uh, I mean, not not like haven't been addressed yet. Sorry, the ones that, oh, we that haven't prioritized. Been yet. Sure. Yeah, like, is it eight and below? Okay. And Danielle, you, Dr. Klingeman, you just said that um, the wellness ones are not urgent. No, nope. next um, fall, anytime in the fall, I think would be great if you think you can get to them okay. by then. Okay. And I should add that um, some of these are just shorthand because I took some of these, the mm -hmm. items that are on this list from our morning meeting a couple of months mm -hmm. ago where we went yep. over the priorities. And so yep. Yep. I'm not like Julia, I can't rattle off policy number TCG. <laughs> I like out of my head so I just so there may be a whistleblower policy that exists somewhere I just can't find it so I'm just you know that's just my shorthand for now yeah you know social media for school committee members which is which has come up there is a policy 
BHE that yeah. mentions a little bit of social media, but my guess is we're getting something a little bit maybe that supersedes that. So at any rate, that's why I wanted to, some of these yeah. things just aren't ready or, for prime time. Yeah, or maybe the social media one is a dash E type guideline that goes into a little bit more of the logistics. Um, I don't know if that exists for that one, but yeah, that, I, I mean, I agree with the um, timing concern with the entrance age one. Um, yeah. that you mentioned. Um, that was going to be my question too, but are we going to change, are we going to have meetings to change it before the start of school, I guess? Like well, I mean, I think we all have to face that we're going to be having a couple of meetings at least this summer, given the circumstances. So I think we could. Yeah, no, that's not the question. Do we think yeah. we could get yeah. something changed and passed in time for this year's kindergartners well when 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 would when would we need to make a final call uh, danielle i don't know if you'd know but when would we need to make a final call on changing like when's the absolute last time last day someone could like green light a kindergartner who right now may not be of age i think before the first day of school so um i think our first day of school for students is september 1st so we can go right up to then if we Probably. if we have we wouldn't want to do that obviously because parents would want to plan but yeah so I think ideally maybe at least a week before then so that yeah. planning could take place but um I mean the 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 community member who wrote the initial email was she did some really good research about what's happening kind of logistics around here and it doesn't seem like it's like a huge leap so I would say maybe we put that one at the top of the list and see if we can address it and put some people's minds at ease that might be falling in that sort of category. Um, so I would say put that at the top of the list and then, you know, just based on the, uh, well, that's just for now. But then I would say the, the for me, the, the anti-bias and the whistleblower stuff is, is really important based on, for obvious reasons. So I would put those like right at number two and three. But that's just my opinion. I, I agree with you, Matt. Does, does anybody else? I mean, I don't think we need to take an official vote. Do, do people agree with that or do we need to? Any other way totally of answering this? Yep. Totally agree? Yep. Okay. Kristen, are you good? I can't see everyone. Can you? Sorry, I'm muted. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm fine that with prioritizing those two. So it would be entrance age and then yep. the Two other oh, the whistleblower and the antibiotics. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Julia, are you good with that? Yeah, yeah. That sounds great. So okay. we'll okay. awesome. Those will go on to our agenda for the next um policy subcommittee meeting. Perfect. And, and also thanks. just um the social media for school committee members. Like we can't I've been learning. I guess that was my um suggestion back in April, but I learned a lot since then, and we cannot make any policies for ourselves. So um, if we just want to change that to review the social media policy that we have to make sure that's in depth as it can be, that's fine. But I guess we can't make a policy for ourselves. So just wanted to update that. Great, thanks. Okay. Good. Okay. So anything else on the policy subcommittee update? That was great. Thank you, Julia and Matt. You're welcome. Good stuff. <clears throat> okay. So I think next up on the discussion items is the superintendent's evaluation. Um, so um, the way this has worked, just a, a little bit of the background for, for the members of the community who are joining us is that um, Dr. Antonucci presents several um, documents to the to the school committee, including um, we review DESE rubrics uh, for superintendent evaluation. He presented an end of the year report and also a self evaluation. And then each individual member did their own individual evaluation of Dr. Antonucci and then um, provided them to me as the chair who um, basically um, put it all together. And so I have kind of a, an assessment across the different categories um, and then a, a very brief statement. And then what we traditionally do is um, let each person say something additional if they so, if they so wish. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and um, 
and get started. Um, and I also just kind of wanted to comment at the beginning, I think, you know, could be a little bit strange to because we're evaluating a superintendent who, who we believe will be leaving the district shortly, but um, the school committee as a whole did feel it was important to evaluate the past year and, and use this review also as an opportunity to learn and, and make adjustments moving forward. Um, so the overall scoring, I got to pull up a different document, so bear with me, on um, for, for the category of student learning, um, the, and I guess I should uh, kind of provide a little bit more of an overview too. So, so they have the, there's these three student learning goal, professional practice goal, and district improvement goals. And the, the, the categories that you can select or did not meet the goal, some progress, significant progress met and exceeded. And so in looking at the um, individuals and compiling them, um, the Dr. Antonucci for the student learning goal, um, it was exceeded. Um, for the professional practice goals met and district improvement goal met. And then there are standards, and this is where you connect it with the DESE rubrics. Um, standard one is instructional leadership. Um, the different categories are unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient, and exemplary. So for instructional leadership, um, the combined score was proficient. Um, for standard two, which is management and operations, the combined score was proficient. For standard three, family and community engagement, um, it was the, again, combined score was proficient. And standard four, which is professional culture, it was also proficient. Um, and then what I did was did a very high um, uh, summary of all comments. So, um, um, and I think, I think this covers, I think hopefully people will hear their own voice within this, you know, a bit. Um, Overall, everyone you know, basically acknowledged that it was an unprecedented year and schools across the country have been struggling with how to navigate the challenges that the pandemic created both within the schools, but also for individual families and with the broader community. Um, Dr. Antonucci did a very good job navigating the return to school and in comparison across the Commonwealth, Duxbury's management of the pandemic was exemplary. Under Dr. Antonucci's leadership, the administration, faculty and staff were able to make significant adjustments over the summer and brought our students back two days per week while improving the learning experience from the initial remote learning in the spring as compared to the return in the fall. Despite these improvements, there was still an adjustment and many in Duxbury uh, were still concerned that students were not receiving the same level of education as pre-pandemic. Um, our district has also been managing two extremely difficult and upsetting, upsetting situations in investigation and litigation um, alleging sexual harassment and an investigation resulting from play girls at a football game this spring. Um, these are challenging situations to navigate and just say it is fair to say that the committee had a variety of feedback regarding these leadership, the leadership around these investigations. Um, I, uh, my individual level, just want to thank Dr. Nancinucci for all the efforts that he's made um, this past year, also the four previous years, um, especially regarding the transparency and clarity that he's brought to the district's budget and the significantly improved uh, relationship with the town. Um, so that that's kind of the high level summary, um, and then I just welcome you know if it, anybody wants to kind of address individual comments, um, we can do that. And I think that's what we've done in the past. Okay, I guess I'll go first. <laughs> I just want to thank um, Dr. Antonucci for everything he's done for this community. Um, in the last four years, he has hired um, a high school principal, a middle school principal, an assistant superintendent, a business manager, um, two personnel managers. I'm sure I'm missing people. Um, it's been absolutely incredible. The people he has brought on board have so benefited our community. Um, and our budget process was in no way transparent before. I was on committee for a long time and I never understood the budget. And the way John has gone through and done line by line itemization, there are no questions. That has led to an increased positive relationship with the town. Um, and so we really are in a good place and we have him to thank. 
the Duxbury Teachers Association um, worked with us, did everything we asked for during these COVID times. Um, the teachers respect John and have a good relationship with him. I speak to mostly middle school and high school parents. I've surveyed them on communication, things like that. Um, I have friends who teach in other districts. They got nowhere near the amount of communication that our district got this year. Um, and COVID itself, we were in in September. We never had to close down. John brought back the different grades at the right time, um, followed all the DESE rules, did everything we could. So I personally, I'm happy that John is going to another district where he can grow. Um, I'm sad for Duxbury, but I really want to compliment and thank John for the hard work and for all that he has done for this community because he really does put children first. Thank you, Kelly. I'm happy to go next if nobody else wants to jump in. So um, as Shannon said, it's kind of odd to be reviewing the performance of a superintendent who's likely to be leaving the district. Um, but I did want to point out some of the things that I have really appreciated about his performance this year that are likely to influence um, the way I think when we conduct our uh, search for his successor. So. Um, as Kelly and Shannon both mentioned, Dr. Antonucci and his team uh, demonstrated great competence in addressing the challenges of running the school district during this COVID year. But to me, what made their instructional leadership exemplary uh, was that in spite of the challenges of running the schools day to day, they began work on a comprehensive two-year plan for learning recovery. Uh, which they presented to um, school committee on April 6th. And just for reference, on May 7th, so a month, a month later, I went to an MASC conference on how school committees should be working with their superintendents to begin to talk about learning recovery. And I came away feeling pretty smug about Duxbury um, after that. So my takeaway there is that we need a superintendent who's not only competent administrator in the moment, um, but also a strategic planner uh, for the longer term. Uh, second, in terms of school operations this year, uh, securing support from two key groups um, has been instrumental in uh, being able to provide services for our students. And the first of those groups is the DTA. Uh, Dr. Antonucci and his team obtained the agreement of the DTA um, to move forward with a hybrid model, and that's no small achievement. I think the news has shown many districts in Massachusetts had difficulties um, in negotiating with their unions. Um, and later on, the DTA worked with the administration to increase in-person instruction, and that's been key. But second, Dr. Antonucci and Mrs. Blake won the approval of key town officials uh, and ultimately town meeting um, to adequately fund the schools when the initial picture was one of severe budget cuts. Um, so my takeaway from those two uh, items is that we need a superintendent who can build trust and professional goodwill, both with educators in our schools and with officials in town hall. And lastly, with regard to district culture, um, Dr. Antonucci and his team first developed a strategic plan using uh, employing community consultation. And this year they, as we heard, launched the Portrait of a Graduate project again with a lot of community input. And both of these things have set very high expectations for our students. But I also wanted to point, it out, point out that back in Dr. Antonucci's very first convocation address, uh, I think it was 2017, he set very high expectations for faculty and staff. And in particular, he articulated an, an expectation of service to students and families by encouraging staff to respond to requests, to balance competing priorities and manage conflicts by continually asking themselves the question, how do we get to yes? 
And where this ethos has permeated our schools, we have seen over the past four years that students and families' experiences have been enriched. And it remains a work in progress for our district, but it's a, a high priority for me. So my takeaway here is that we need a superintendent who can engage the school community in responding effectively to change and disagreement and in constructively resolving conflict. So that's my summary. I guess, or do you want to go, Matt? No, go ahead, Kristen. Okay, so um, first I wanted to congratulate you on your 2021 MASS uh, President's Award. Um, that's a huge honor and congratulations. Um, no doubt you've had a very challenging year and um, I think we all appreciate your efforts and um, time that you spent working for the children. Um, since I've been on, I just want to thank you for responding to my emails and my multiple emails and all my questions. Um, I appreciate that you've been receptive to, you know, my concerns and, you know, I appreciate it. I did um, find it challenging um, to complete the evaluations for two main reasons. One, I felt that I needed some sort of report from the football evaluation to really kind of assess leadership. Um, and it was kind of frustrating that we didn't have anything. So I found that difficult. And the second thing I felt that was missing was that I feel to truly assess a leader, you need to hear from the people they lead. And unfortunately, it's just something that I would like to see going forward with whoever we hire, um, that we set up an evaluation system that allows for the feedback from teachers, students, administration, and staff. And more so that we can really find out where our strengths and weaknesses are and establish goals um, for the next superintendent to address those. Um, I feel like uh, communication is a two-way process and you did provide the families with a, a lot of communication this past year. However, I just feel like the recept receptiveness to feedback questions and concerns from some families was concerning. Um, the tone that was taken with parents at times was harsh and confrontational. And I would have liked to seen a little bit more coming from the outside. I would have liked to seen a little bit more conversation. Um, and just a, I know you can't please everybody, but sometimes I just think being heard and just feeling heard makes a difference and being part of the process. So I think that would have been good. Um, under management and operations, you had stated that you made decisions to try and like shield uh, the school committee from legal liability, I would have just liked to seen, um, where am I at? I would have just liked to see more communication and conversation and discussion. And I know you're trying to protect our district and I appreciate that, but sometimes I feel like maybe a conversation might've been um, also helpful. Um, some things that I'm really happy with, um, DOG certification, which is amazing for especially our younger uh, children. Um, the Duxbury High School Cooperative Learning, I think, is an amazing experience. The training that'll be, um, that started in the spring for the coaches, coaches um, your own dedication to your professional growth. Um, and just in closing, I wish you the best of luck on your new endeavors. And I think that's it. Um, I just have a, a few things to say. Um, First, I, I think that, um, you know, as I, as I look through my, the evaluation that I wrote, it's fairly consistent with how I felt over the, um, over the last year at a, at a high level. And so what I'll say is that, John, once again, I think that operationally, you are peerless in the industry from what I've seen, like just your ability to um, articulate, um, finances in a way that is understandable and in plain English and that exposes the the needs of you know where we are as a district is in my opinion unmatched so as an operating officer just a great great job and that's been consistent for the whole four years um it's it's already been said I mean instructional leadership was critical obviously it's always critical this year it was you know uh, just, you know, a amplified and compounded. 
uh, because of the um, because of the COVID situation. And I had an opportunity to um, to observe some of the classes at the middle school and high school, and I was really I was blown away just by the the what I saw in the in the classrooms. And I think I talked about it at another school committee. I mean, the ability for the teachers to engage kids in the class with masks and at the same time simultaneously involve the kids that were on Zoom was really, really special and it was wonderful. And I think the evidence is, um, you know, pretty, pretty clear in, in terms of, you know, sort of the outcomes. I mean, having that said, no one, not everyone's going to be happy. And as school committee members, we hear a lot from the community and, you know, that was, you know, sort of a mixed bag in terms of like some, certain people feeling like their students weren't served well enough. Other people told me that, you know, they had gifted and talented students who weren't challenged enough. And so I think you're always going to hear that. But on the whole, I think your instructional leadership uh, during this year was 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 first rate um, amid the the pandemic. Um, it, it pains me to say this because of, with all the things that I think that you're really, really good at, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I'm going to look for in a new superintendent is not only content, but style. And the way, what I've been trying to articulate since, you know, probably the beginning of this calendar year is that communication is more than an onslaught of hundreds of, of newsletters. Um, communication to me is a, is a matter of making people in the community believe that you care what they have to say. And I have to say that your style in that regard, I think is, is lacking. And I, you know, I, I put a needs improvement for family and community engagement, not because I don't, I don't think that the portrait of a graduate and the strategic plan did not have sufficient community involvement. Um, you know, one of the things that you've put in your evaluation is that, you know, a lot of the communication and collaboration happens behind the scenes. I believe you, but I can only see what's on stage. And when I see, you know, public comment and people's concerns that are valid to them be, from my point of view, dismissed or, you know, treated in an aggressive or a hostile or adversarial manner, I think that's a problem. And I think it's a problem because it, it's unfortunate because how great you are at articulating the budget and the needs for the school, that's great. But if the community doesn't believe that we care about them or care about what they have to say, it's going to make it really, really difficult, I think, for us to make a case for them to vote for an override or other mechanisms that will help us fund our schools properly. And so I think it's unfortunate that the style is um, is is something that, that that I wasn't really happy with, particularly this year when people were really in 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 a lot of pain. And then just to I think this is is somewhat consistent with what um, what Kristen said about professional culture. I can't comment on whether the culture in this district right now is one hundred percent professional because I simply just don't have optics into. Um, anything with regard to either either uh, sort of case or um, what's the word uh, investigation that's that that's going on, and you know, kind of like the pipeline document that I just talked about with you know with policy, I don't know the law to the letter, but my sense is that you know even a high level status report to the people on the school committee to give us some confidence so that we can support the school rather than have to answer parents who are worried and say well i don't know anything that's going on but i'm sure the school's doing the right thing that's hard that's just that that that's hard and so um one of the things i'm going to be looking for in a in a new superintendent is someone that makes me feel like we're invited a little bit more closely under the tent So that's that. That's what I have to say. I do. I do wish you the best of luck. I'm sorry that you know you're leaving in in the middle of your your contract. I understand why. Um, and you know, I I, I wish you the best of luck in in North Attleboro. Okay. So. Um, um, John. I think there's a resounding thank you um, 
for everything that you've done. I think we do have some evaluation process things that we can work on. Um, um, Kristen, I, I think 360 is a really good idea. So I think that's something that we should consider going forward for sure. And um, the other piece was, I've heard from a lot of other school committees that they do their evaluation before elections. Um, so I'm just wondering if we can figure out something where we do like as much as we can. I know we have an early um, election, so it's a little tough, but we could do like a three quarter evaluation and then finish it up with a quarter evaluation, something like that. Anyways, I just, you know, as we're talking, these kind of more process ideas are kind of popping into my head. So I just want to make sure that not to, to lose that piece. Um, so I think that's it for that. Okay. Um, Shannon, so, can I just sort of make one yeah. more comment that I left absolutely. out? On my, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I didn't bring up the two large events that John had to contend with this year. The first, um, students on the football field using the term Auschwitz, which um, John didn't ask for, didn't know about, didn't coach the team. Um, had to deal with the coach took responsibility and resigned. Um, and I think that was handled properly. We have an independent investigator. The report isn't out yet. I don't know why everybody is blaming John for that. And, and I check in with John weekly. When are we going to hear? When are we going to hear? So that if anybody asks me, I can tell them. Now we know that the report's going to come out. And then the John Blake um, lawsuit, which is absolutely tragic, and my heart is broken for the Foley family. Um, that occurred before any of us were here. And with the legal protections under the law, um, I think that John has said absolutely. Uh -oh. Lost her. Um, and it, oh, yeah. that. Um, you know, North Attleboro has absolutely no problem with the way that John handled um, the situation. So I just, I didn't say that piece in my evaluation, but that that is part of my, um, how I feel about the situation. And I think everything has been handled absolutely appropriately. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Okay. Um, so next on our agenda is um, uh, public comment. Again, our second time, um, I guess I'm not going to read the whole statement again, but I just, the statement that I read at the beginning about the appropriateness of code comment, please take that into consideration. I'm going to also ask Dr. Antonucci to assist me in bringing folks over into the meeting. I see Rachel Stadman's hand is up. Hi, can you hear me? You got your right hand. Hi, Rachel. Hi. You know, first of all, um, thank you to the school committee for the work that you're doing um, and your care and concern for all of our students. I think having discourse respectfully is so important um, because that's how change happens. I want to say an enormous thank you to Dr. Antonucci um, for just what I've seen from the inside as a teacher in the district. I love what Kristen said about evaluating our administrators. I think that's really important and it's a piece that we might be missing. Um, and if I were to tell you the number of times I've gone to Dr. Antonucci regarding concerns um, in terms of um, um, student anxiety or, or what our kids are facing, he just immediately, and I'm one of hundreds of people and stakeholders he answers to, he just immediately responds and, um, and is very candid. And so I want to say an enormous thank you. I'm not at all surprised that um, Attleboro has scooped up Dr. Antonucci. I have seen such incredible changes since he and Dr. Klingeman have um, been at the helm of our leadership this year. Uh, the last few years. And, um, and I just appreciate everyone on the school committee and your comments and your concerns. Um, and I just want to congratulate Dr. Antonucci uh, for being recognized for his greatness um, as a leader for students and communities. If I, um, I can't share everything 
that I have um, experienced with Dr. Antonucci, but I, I want people to just trust that I care so much about the children in our town from, from the moment they enter our schools till the moment they leave. Um, and I wouldn't raise my hand and speak on um, Dr. Antonucci's behalf if I had any reservations about the quality of his character um, and his leadership. When things are really hard to deal with and we're faced with a lot of really enormous issues facing our kids and our community, it's easy to want to find one person to place the blame on. But I think we're all um, responsible for what happens in our district. And again, I just want to thank the school committee for your wonderful and thoughtful comments and for your support. And um, and just really, I'm, I'm just very happy for Dr. Antonucci um, and his new endeavor and for the community he'll be serving. So thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, okay. Rachel. Appreciate that. Uh, next is Tamara Serrata. Hi, Ms. Serrata. Tamara Serrata. Um, I don't know. I don't know who's controlling the screen, but we can't see everyone. Just so you know, so I don't know um, who's still on the call that I'm speaking to. So try that. <clears throat> I just maybe change the view. I think it changed when someone did a screen share and then it didn't, it just didn't change back. Oh, um, that's weird. Didn't Jen, did Jen Cotton leave then? That's who I was looking for. Um, well, I wanted to make a comment on her present presentation about the portrait of a graduate. Um, and I'm curious to know how the attributes she talked about will apply to our special education students. And so um, just a couple of examples. Say, for example, you have an autistic student who is pretty lacking in theory of mind. And um, how do you teach that student empathy? Like, what would be the plan for that? Say, for example, you have a student with a psychiatric diagnosis that makes that student particularly rigid and inflexible. How do you teach that student flexi flexibility, flexible thinking? How, do you, how will you teach that? Um, say you have a student who has a history of being unsuccessful or, you know, damaged by life in whatever way. How do you teach that student to be resilient? And so I'm hoping as this um, program gets developed across the curriculum and across the grades <laughs> that um, there will be opportunities for our special education students to access um, the same lessons that other students will be able to access in a way that can be helpful to them. I feel like um, our special ed students are, are sometimes overlooked and um, programs are developed for sort of the majority of students. And, you know, these are great attributes and it would be wonderful to see the special education students be able to access them as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Helpful feedback. Okay. Looks like we do not have any more hands raised. Oh. We do. We do. Joseph Foley. Can you hear me okay? We can. Yeah. Great. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to address this, but I think it's a, it's a fair enough question. To throw it, I'll throw it out to anyone and anyone on the call. Um, from a leadership perspective, I would just appreciate candor around this. I'd asked for some clarity about a month or so ago from the school committee. Um, I was told that was not gonna be provided, but maybe just I'll take one more shot at it. John, in your statement in early April to the school committee, you mentioned that John Blake had violated district policy. I'm just curious about policy in your findings he had violated. You also mentioned that his employment had terminated on April 1st, but I'd just like some clarity because a number of people have asked me, was he allowed to resign or if he was fired for cause? And if so, what was the cause? Madam Chair, I'm not able to answer those questions. They're personal. No, I understand personnel matter. Thank you, Mr. Foley. Um, okay. Um, Janet, can I just correct okay. the record? 
I said the coach Mamoron um, resigned from coaching football when he took responsibility. He actually didn't resign. He was fired. I want to okay. just correct my what I said. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, it looks like we do not have any more hands raised. So I'm going to go back to my agenda and it looks like we do not have any action items tonight. Is that accurate? Yeah. Right. So, so then we um, are adjourning into executive section uh, a session. Um, the school committee will be going into executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining with the Duxbury Teachers Association Unit C Instructional Assistance and AFSCME Custodial Union which would have a detrimental effect on the position of the governing body if the discussion were in open session. The board will not return to open session. If I could have a motion to adjourn to executive session, please. Oh, I can't hey, hear you. You're, you're uh... muted. <laughs> that wasn't an exciting motion to adjourn. I was just wondering if I could just say one thing. Am I allowed to? If not, I won't. Okay. It's not bad. I, I don't tell me I don't want to mess yeah. up the policy. Okay, um, I just wanted to say that um, during the speeches, the em embrace your blunder speech that was given was really truly amazing, and I hope you all go back and watch it. But I just want to say, when I was thinking back to it, I just feel like we all need to embrace embrace the blunders from this year, reflect on our many successes, learn from both, and apply those lessons to ensure a successful year next year. And I just think, you know, we have a great opportunity here uh, to really come together as a group and to pick a superintendent as a community. And, you know, let's, let's try and embrace this and have a great year next year. And let's have a good summer. And Dr. Antonucci, I wish you the best of luck in North Attleboro. And I think we can all just take a deep breath and say great job in getting through this heck of a year and go on to next year. I was not a cheerleader. So, <laughs> motion to adjourn, Shannon. There you go, thank you. Second. Okay, okay. Um, so roll call, uh, Julia. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Matt. Aye. Kristen. Aye. Okay, Shannon, aye. Um, John, how does this work? Are you going to send a separate link for the executive session? Yeah, just check your email. I'll, I'll launch a meeting. Um, we'll see you in a few okay. minutes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Take Good care. night. Bye.